Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone to the Power Tech Talk event series. Now, this is going to be a monthly networking event where we're going to be talking about blockchain, gaming, technology, community building. So this is going to great, be great for anybody who works in gaming, works in crypto, Web3, or even if you're an indie game developer. This particular series is hosted by Sky Mavis and organized by S-World. And this is also our first time collaborating with IGGV, which is the Indie Games Group with Google. Now, my name is Patrick Dang, if you don't know me already, and I am going to be your host tonight. So starting things off, uh, we're going to have three panels today. The first panel is going to be all about monetizing and marketing. The second panel is going to be game design in Web3. And the third panel is going to be funding for indie games. So now we're going to start with the first panel, which is monetization and marketing thinking big from day one. And so I'm going to go ahead and introduce our lovely speakers today. The first one that we have is going to be Quinn, who is the VP of Growth at Sky Mavis. Come on down, Quinn. All right, next up, we're going to have Laura, who is the account manager at Amazon Web Services in the startups department. Give her a round of applause. Yes, let's go. Finally, we have Nathaniel, who is the co-founder of Avia. Let's give him a round of applause as he comes up. So starting things off, obviously, you know, during this time, we're kind of in a bear market, right? So people aren't as excited about crypto and NFTs like they were before. But, you know, there still is a market. There are definitely people who are still interested. What are some of the best ways to get people to actually try your game and play it? You know, we just announced five new games coming to Ronin yesterday. Um, and one of them is, is live already and in early access. Um, it's like a top-down third-person shooter. It's really badass. But, you know, the way that we're gro going about growing it right now is really kind of like two swim lanes in parallel. Right, so one is really leaning into like the early stages of Web3. We're kind of using token incentive and community incentive to actually build our Discord really quickly. The flip side of what we're doing uh, is like true kind of community-led growth, um, and this is you know this is critical in Web2 and in Web3. Um, but what it really comes down to is like building your core user base, and this is very grindy work. It's very white glove, right? Jiho, our chief growth officer here at Sky Mavis, he talks about how in the early days of Axie. He used to know every single community member like by name. He had a one-to-one -one relationship. It's obviously not possible anymore once you hit you know, 10,000, 100,000, a million active community members. But in the early days of any Web3 project, you want to have that level of relationship with your core members because they're the ones that become your ultimate evangelists in the long term. And so that's like the second swim lane that we're trying to do with these, with these new games right now. Uh, unlike Queen, I'm sure that all of you probably know him already because he's very famous. So let me do a proper introduction about myself. So um, I'm, I'm from Amazon Web Service, uh, Web3 uh, and gaming account managers for, for Amazon Web Service. And I had a chance to work with, I think like a number of Web3 is like over 100 um, in Vietnam and Philippines in particular. Uh, I did a, a tier six for my, uh, for my MBA actually on Game 5 in Vietnam. So to show like how bullish I am about um, you know, like game and Web3 here. I think that uh, for all of the founder Web2 or Web3, um, if you want to have or, or like to let the player uh, engage more with the game, you have to ask yourself a question first. What can you do to let the user or like the gamer to spend more time on, on your game, right? You can start with create a community. Uh, you have a uh, different influencer as well and don't have to try a lot of time with you know big influencer when you just like started your new game. Maybe just even like the medium as long as the one they understand about your game um, and, and they're willing to, to talk you know nicely and they love your game as well. Maybe like set a KPI for yourself like today like they spend like 10 seconds tomorrow I don't know like or next month they can spend a little bit more. Yeah I, I think the word of warning I'm sorry to hijack but I think the word of warning there is oftentimes if you rely on from a web3 perspective if you rely too much on like paying users to come to you on basically questing users into your game what we found is that quests create mercenaries. They only show up to do whatever action you're paying them for and then they'll leave after that. And so finding these longer term growth loops that actually create retention, I think that's really critical. I have an interesting perspective because I actually look at both Web2 game studios and Web3 game studios. And, and to give a bit of an introduction of myself, I, I actually was a lawyer before I jumped into the Wild Wild West of Web3. So I, I was working with a lot of the Web3 crypto kind of clients for a good five or six years. And then I was like, you know, the, the growth is going to be here. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, I, I used to do work in Vietnam. I was doing private equity, m and I worked with Kindle. Quite a so, so I really love Vietnam. 
this question of you know web 3 web 2 studios is exactly what we look for and some people think of the game as a product but sometimes if you look at mechanics as the product the gamification of it how do i earn that token what is the risk i have what is the excitement i go through when i try to earn that that itself i think is a gamification technique as well so so what we're doing now is that when we work with a number of our game partners so one of which is i think indonesia's largest if not one of the largest game studios called um, Agate Studios, Minic Protocol. In, in our partnership, we're looking at, okay, if you introduce, if you want to bring Web3 into your Web2 game, do you introduce your character as the NFT? Do you introduce the weapon as the NFT? Do you earn, when is, is it a PvP kind of when you earn a token? Is it questing? Is it just adventuring and questing when you earn the, the token? Do you have, do you need to add that risk element where let's say you lose the battle and your NFT gets burned? Where does the price pool come on? How do I make things more sustainable, you know, in the long run, right? You, you can't have the influx and you can't really just be throwing money at the people, right? So these game studios try a number of these what we call game formats and Web3 formats to see what is the most attractive kind of measure to attract both Web2 and Web3 audiences. Okay, interesting. Actually, I have a question. Do you feel like... What's more important, like designing a really good game that people want to play or designing the mechanics around incentives, which is also a game that people want to play? Because right now, the majority of the market is actually traders, right? Th that is the exact hypothesis that we have. Right? I think in a Web2 game, it's important that the product is important, right? I mean, I must enjoy. Your art must be good, your storyline must be good, your kind of game design and leveling and balancing needs to be good. I, I think that makes a game fun. What Web3 adds in, in terms of that layer is that the game may not be just the product itself. What do I stand to earn? What do I stand to lose? How do I onboard? What is that potential reward? I, I, I think there's a, the financialization of Web3 allows game studios to kind of add that layer. So you have a more complex kind of product. All right, when you think about it, for, for a blockchain game or any game in general that's doing Web3, right? I always wonder like, you know, what, what is their budget for like user acquisition? And a lot of times, a lot of games don't even have a budget. But how do they acquire users, right? And then it's some, it's actually something else. Like you have, you guys have thoughts on that? So I think th this is where you kind of have the divide, right? You, you, you see Web3 game studios coming in just purely focusing on the whole speculative nature. Yeah. And then you have Web2 studios coming in, which was, you know, triple A, amazing kind of graphics, but, but not knowing how to utilize that kind of Web3 layer. I think the ideal or, or the, the vision of Web3 is how do I kind of manage both so that, and, and it's a balance, right? You, you can't have something that's purely speculative because, I mean, that, then it's not a game, right? But you can't have something with a pure game, then if not, why not just publish in Web2, you know? Where does the Web3 come in? But, and, and that playbook, how do I use Web3? I think it's something that people have been trying to figure out for the last... So I'll, I'll just add one thing, it, since we're speaking kind of about marketing, right? And in, maybe in the Web3 era as well, and you know, we talked about UA, um, one thing I'm extremely interested in, and no one solved for this yet, is what is a Web3 native advertisement going to look like? When we think ad right now, we think banner, we think interstitial, we think rewarded video. And like those are super successful Web2 ads. Right? If we just take that and copy paste it into Web3, we're just using Web2 design thinking to try to do advertising in Web3. And like I think it'll work well enough, but there's going to be some Web3 native advertisement that kind of just blows our mind, right? Airdrops was like the first pass at it, right? Um, and airdrops didn't really work. You know, if you pull up OpenSea, you see all these random airdrops in your wallet, it feels kind of scammy. So it failed, but like that is a first pass at a Web3 native version of advertising. And yeah, I don't know what the answer is going to be, but there'll be something powerful that kind of comes. You know, in the past, right, a lot of the game when they design and then they kind of like force advertisement that the user had to watch, right? So instead of forcing them, right, maybe you can allow them to trade that time, right? To like, okay, let's watch that time. And after that, you can earn a certain thing. Like you can earn like, I don't know, like skin in the game or like you can earn a certain token as well. So the user will feel like very willing to watch that one. And also it's good for the game as well, right? So I, I have a theory about this. I think in terms of advertising, we've seen advertising kind of evolve across the years, right? I think if you talk about the first, you know, blocks or, or you know, WordPress or whatever, I think that was what we call mass advertising. You know, as, as long as you had uh, traffic posting any kind of ad, you earn, you know, Google Sense, AdSense, right? You, you earn money. And then that kind of evolved to what I call targeted advertising. You know, you, with social media, you know, I know this guy is, uh, what, 25 year old, you know, he has two dogs and therefore I advertise dog food to him, right? I think what's the next bound? You know, so mass to targeted, but what, what's really next bound? Web3 has proposed some solutions. Is it community-based? Is it reward-based? Or what, what, what is that advertisement model? I think that question is actually exactly what we are trying to answer. I don't have the answer yet. All right, so 
switching gears a little bit, I want to bring more value to people who are, let's say, indie game developers, right? People who are creating games, maybe they, you know, are doing it by themselves, or maybe they have a small team. You know, a team like this, you know, how would they, like, what approach would they take when it comes to marketing, especially in Web3? I think that there is a cost and a benefit to, to Web3, right? I, I think the, the financialization of an asset attracts a lot of people. But at the same time, if it's not built sustainably, then somebody takes the loss somewhere. I think the benefit of Web3 is that you can really operate in a very, very lean team. Like, like you know, I, I've seen teams with three, five, seven people. And that's really, really a small team launch, a full-on game, nothing too polished, but you know, when you financialize your asset and the chance to profit, that attracts a lot of people. I think the jury is still out as to whether that's a sustainable model. I, I have some doubts as to how it is, but I, I think maybe the, the, one of the concepts we are looking at in terms of marketing is that sometimes you think, try to think seasonal in time periods. So if you look at what Yuga Labs is doing, which is you know, the, the body producer, when they published the game, it was just for one week or for you know, two weeks and, and a month. And when you add that kind of time period to a Web3 product, then it, you, know, you kind of reduce the loss of people because they know it's, hey, you know, I am here, I'm here to experience it for a month. And after the month, the season ends. And, and that's it, you know, the, 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 the stakes end there. I think one of the problems of Web3 now when people financialize it and they try to rely on the marketing community is that there, there's no end and people therefore have unmet expectations and they end up carrying bags. That kind of creates this infinite hype cycle. I, I get that. Yeah, yeah, correct. My advice here to anyone just starting out in, in Web3, especially on the marketing and growth side, one thing I always say, right, when you're launching a new product uh, in Web2, your first goal is to find your first 1 million paying users. When you're launching something new in Web3, your first goal is to find your first 10,000 co-owners of your network, right? And I think that's why we see all these like 6,000, 10,000, 15,000 PFE projects, et cetera, right? But the thing is, is that each one of these early token holders that you onboard, because they hold one of your NFTs, they hold one of your governance tokens, they are truly kind of the co-owners of this network that you're creating. They will be the ones that actually go out and evangelize and onboard the next 100,000 users into your ecosystem for you. All right, that makes sense. And um, as we get closer to the end of this panel, I want to give a little time for the audience to ask a few questions uh, for our panelists here. So if anybody has a question, feel free to raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. So who has the first question, guys? Uh, hello, uh, I'm Ann from um, Lost Lab Metalos. So nothing about monetization for Web3 games until now. So could you just talk a little bit about that? All right, so I've got a thesis right now on a lot of games that, a lot of growth teams, I speak to a lot of marketing and growth teams in Web3, and they're all going after existing Web3 users. Let's call them active addresses, okay? Go acquire active users, do the hard work of minting them onto the blockchain, turning them into an active address. And then on the back end, there's these really badass Web3 ad networks that are just springing up, folks like Hype Lab um, and Splice as well. You can plug them in, and then all of these Web3 projects are going to go crazy trying to acquire the active addresses that you've just created, right? So there's, I'll, I'll give uh, my, my perspective on it. And I'm not, I'm not a gaming expert. I'm more into the NFT side, but I observe it. So for most projects, how they generate revenue is either they sell assets, like digital assets, or they get a cut of a transaction fee, right? So if they take mm -hmm. like 5% every time someone buys and sells, that is a form of royalty, right? I have a different theory on this. If you look at Web2 games, right? The Web2 monetization model is pretty clear, right? I mean, there's ad revenue, I mean, your freemium, you have this in-game assets. I think, obviously, this continues to apply in, in a Web3 game studio because, you, you, I mean, you create games, you, you still can sell assets, you still can have your transactions inside. I, I think the Web2 monetization strategies continue to apply, right? As of now, it is still a kind of marketing expense. You kind of pay the rewards to kind of track users. I think the Web3 innovation is going to come in, how do I slice the pie so that I have the risk of playing the game? So if, so when I play a Web3 game, if I have to buy the NFT to play, that's, that's capital upfront. It's paying to play. How do I design so that of that pie, some people earn some reward in a sustainable way without relying on, uh, you know, on unlimited growth at the same time where, while the studio takes a cut? I think there are a number of Web2 companies which kind of explore this. To be, to be upfront, it kind of treads very close to the 
gaming, gambling kind of scene, which we've we got to be really careful on. Okay, so this gentleman gave you the vision, so you had a lot of time to think about. So let me get just like in tactical here. So I, I think there are a few ways you can do that as well. Uh, either Web2 or Web3, but just be creative with the way that you try to monetize your game. Because the fundraising landscape right now is not that great that you can raise funds like last year. So like earlier I say, right, you can just totally trade, uh, allow the people right, to trade their times. And then after that, uh, with, with, like, to, to get a certain like, rewarding, because of that, you get like, monetization from the advertisement. The second one as well is that um, you can do the branding, like call, uh, work with different brands, um, allow that to be in your games, uh, which is like I saw a number of games doing at the moment. I heard on the um, mobile games podcast as well, it's a really good one. They talk a little bit about subscriptions, web. Uh, store monetization as well is also another one that uh, you can think about. But like I say, it's a very technical, very short term for, for in my opinion. But I think that's a, what you need right now with the current landscape. Yeah. All right. Do we have time for more questions or is that the end of the panel? Okay, we have another question. Thank you for the presentation. It was really cool. Um, I, my name is Buga. I work for Zerion. Uh, so I'm uh, coordinating integration, so quite aware about the space. And I can see like upcoming trends of the things which cause on-chain marketing. Um, like if you guys hear about this and uh, if you like try to implement it, and um, like what do you imagine when you hear on-chain marketing basically? Could, could you actually give us some context of what you've seen? You've seen some on-chain marketing already? You can see like the spread of your users, like if it's your community, let's say Zerion users and Axi users, we have like 20% uh, the same people, right? And then we try to do something to activate your users to become our, and then our to become your. Um, yeah, it's, it's so cool what's going on right now, right? The amount of segmentation that you can do and targeting that you can do based on on-chain data is just incredible. We're actually doing this um, activation right now. Um, and we're using this really cool tool called Superfine, um, superfine.gg if anyone wants to check it out. And what we're trying to do, basically from, all right, Ronin is our, our own blockchain network. And so we sat down and we said, how can we, how can we target them specifically acquire them into the Ronin network, and then make them sticky users once they get there. And so what we're doing is we're using this tool um, to basically segment based on their on-chain transactions and the assets that they hold. So we're running advertising, we're targeting these users. Anyone who sees this ad can click on it, they'll land on a landing page and connect their wallet. But if a Web3 hardcore gamer shows up and they connect their wallet and we're able to see that they've interacted with these three smart contracts, all of which are Web3 games, and they hold a number of uh, NFTs that are high value, all attached to other Web3 games, then we'll automatically say, great, Web3 gamer, hardcore, and the landing page will pop up and say, hey, congratulations, um, you just received a Ronin welcome package. And within that, it includes like Tenron, uh, a team of three axes that are like very powerful, um, and early access keys to the Machines Arena, a game that we just launched, right? So it's like targeting and segmenting based on on-chain data. I think it's really cool what, what is about to be unlocked for us. My name is Aid from Brain Drain Games. We work on VR and uh, mobile. Um, you were talking about marketing, um, and I, the topic is marketing from day one. And as an indie studio, you know, we see a lot of things like um, targeted marketing on Facebook, uh, social media, things like that. And many of these things are very clickbaity. You know, it's uh, showing gameplay that isn't even the actual game. So, what would you say? I mean, besides that, what would you say is the best for an indie studio? in terms of return on investment for marketing, what is the best way to start up from day one? Social media, um, like a building community, not just Web 2 or Web 3, but what would be the best way to actually build um, and advertise? Let me tell you what we did and, and experience from there. We, we started with a collection of 1,000 NFTs, and I spoke, we spoke to about 2,500 people across 600 hours, across X number of interviews, one-on-one, -on -one, telling them, explaining to them what we were doing, the vision of where we were building, where the user journey and where they will come along and their role. And, and till today, this remains one of our closest, strongest, and most supportive. And, and when you invest time in them, they actually do stay with you. I think that what Web3 brought about in the community building is that if you really invest in that one-on-one, -on -one, at least from the start, solidifies your first 500,000 people, and then you work from there. This method obviously doesn't work for 10,000, 20,000, 50,000. All right, well, thank you for that question. So now we actually have a few gifts for our lovely panelists today. All right, guys, so before we dive into questions, could you guys maybe each do a quick origin story, self-intro kind of thing? 
Uh, my name is Duy Phan. I'm uh, currently the lead game designer of uh, AC Homeland. So hello everyone, uh, my name is Doug and I'm currently the media producer of Scammervis. Before joining Scammervis, I mostly working in the game and uh, film industry. I'm joining for Scammervis for, you know, for, you know, take up the challenge with the new World War 3. And didn't you actually work on BB-8's character in Star Wars previously? Yes, I do. I uh, work for the last three uh, uh, Star Wars movie. So, and, uh, anyone here, if you have a problem with it, <laughs> please say so. Yes, uh, so I uh, did uh, call inside the BBI character. Awesome. All right, let's let's jump into this, guys. Game design for Web3. We, I would actually love to get two different perspectives. So maybe you can take this from the art side of game design, and you can take this really from the game design side of game design. So what are the differences when designing a game for Web3 or like NFT gaming? Um, versus more traditional Web2 gaming? The most different is that uh, Web3 game design, we don't just uh, design one game. When we talk about uh, each individual game, it's not that different from making a traditional game. It still needs to be fun. Uh, it still needs to get uh, people to engage in it. What the Web3 as a technology cannot provide the value to the game. And that's one is some answer that I think that's no, it's not gonna be answer for like another five years of research because we are actually it's in a very early stage of uh, Web3 gaming right now. For an example, if we are talking about the internet, the uh, game that we are currently make right now is like uh, Mario with uh, Mario Online. So online game start with the um, co-op like between two player. That's in the multi uh, multiplayer uh, way start, and then it's involved into having a lot more like four players. It's not until like five or ten years that we uh, actually get a, a, a solid MMORPG. And that is when we rely what true global multiplayer is. So what we have to do now is like finding that MMORPG for Web3. It's still early for sure. You know, I think one common maybe argument or refrain that a, a lot of people like to make is that not every game needs to have a Web3. And then there are people on the flip side of that argument who think, you know, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it, we won't call it Web3 gaming, we'll just call it gaming because everything will have a Web3 element. Well, I'd love to know where you kind of stand there. Do you think that every game will eventually be Web3 and, and have blockchain behind it in some way? Or do you think we'll always have a Web2 version? Just like that, we, uh, like we have an MMORPG now, we still have offline game. So Web2, Web2 game is will still stay in it. Yeah. What we need to see is that uh, we need to see Web3 game as a, no, a different way. Like Web3 game is not just a game, it's an ecosystem. And in order to do that, it still needs a lot of game insights and it still need a lot of co cooperation from the industry to make that dream become a, really a reality. So, you know, um, Sky Mavis, we recently released our, our lore trailer uh, to the community, something we're very, very excited about. Um, I'd love for you to kind of maybe first share a little bit about the story behind uh, Axies, uh, Axies to begin with. And then, uh, you know, how will that story and, and uh, the lore of Axie Infinity be connected throughout everything in the ecosystem? The lore of the Axies universe is about a divided war that the Axies trying to find their own identity. And personally, like, why we pick that story? Because that story is very easy to be relatable, you know. So someone trying to find to find who who they are, what make them, and what uh, in the future fighting them. I, th I think it's something that we own here to share, and some something like it. This uh, this talk is exactly about like exactly like the game of the homeland game. Uh, Zui is uh, the developing about like first day some um, gameplay mechanic that uh, we we put it up in. As, as a solid, when when we test the game, there is the uh, people that they start to find their own way of you know their own personal way of playing the games, right? And this is exactly like when I, I, we feel like we are they starting to cosplay into the character of the game when they follow the story by playing the game. You know, it's it's just like uh, the the story is just not something that you know uh, we we putting into the law, we writing into the item descriptions but it's uh, got imbued into every single element of the game. You know, we, now we've got Axie Infinity Classic, we've got Axie Infinity Origins, um, we've got Ray Lights, right? And obviously we've got land gameplay as well. 
I'd love to know, are there any kind of key principles uh, when designing an Axie Infinity game? Uh, anything that has to kind of be consistent across a number of games? Uh, let's like say before that we are making a web tree when we are making an uh, ecosystem. So it means that when you, we lay a foundation for one game, we need to uh, uh, make it really big because uh, that foundation is not support only that game only. But it's a place where the other game can uh, put their uh, stuff in to connect with uh, this. And also we need to understand that um, what is should be a Web3 asset and what should be an off-chain asset. Because uh, if everything is a Web3, it doesn't make any sense. Like you cannot control it. Like everything will be crumbled. You cannot uh, balance everything that is uh, in an open-end market where they can just name a price and they get, they get it. Um, it's uh, the game you crumble by SF because uh, you cannot control the input and the output and it will become inflation. inflation. In order to uh, make it a web tree asset, we need to like, have like, the, uh, eco uh, the whole ecosystem uh, use it. And one of the things that I feel like that is a very big potential of a web tree assets is that it cannot really actually change value over time. I make two games and then I was a blacksmith in uh, one game. I make a sock and then I put my digital signature on it. Then uh, uh, I mean it and then uh, it become a web three asset and people can buy that sock to play in another game. But then one day in this game, I become like something like a legendary blacksmith. Then every every web three uh, sock that I make will receive a book for our other game too. It's become a legendary weapon. You mentioned how there's these important trade-offs. If something doesn't need to be tradable, if something doesn't need to be a Web3 asset, then why make it a Web3 asset? Did you run into any you know, ex examples as you were designing Homeland of, of having a hard time deciding whether an in-game asset should be a Web2 or a Web3 asset? Mm -hmm. Like when we make Homeland, there's a lot of requests from the communities is to make like every resource, resource in the Homeland, like the wood and the stone, to be a Web3. And so they can just wait. The thing is that if you do it that way, uh, you pretty much like introduce a uh, foreign currency into the game because people can just like you USD to buy the resource and then uh, they use it in the game and it will break the balance because we control how many stone, how many wood that uh, the, the player can earn every day so that we can keep the progress of the game. Uh, uh, on in a way that there is a balance, uh, balance for everyone. So if we are going to make a Web3 uh, asset, it needs to be something special. Like it has to be like, um, let's say a relic from the past of a Nazi and anyone who hold that relic will be upgraded to the status of a hero in the Axie bus. And that is something that uh, if you by chain can grab it or can find it uh, in uh, the game, you can mean it and then use it in another game. Pretty much like become the hero of the Axie bus. I'm looking forward to that. Next question here, with the current lore, what other genres do you think we might start to see? What other genre of, of gameplays do you think we might start to see in the Axie, Axie universe? Actually, uh, in the Axie universe, I believe like a lot of genre could uh, mm -hmm. happen in there. We do dreams about one day, you know, like uh, the people in the homeland they could uh, initiate a battle, and that battle will be played by the other people in uh, other games, such as like uh, AC Origins or not the title of uh, AC. The result of that battle will directly reaffect them into the strategic gameplay of the of the homeland. Uh, that is uh, Web3 gaming that we dreaming about. You know, we do. You have your own power, but you also have to rely on the other people, on the community, a lot more variable. And it will make it more exciting. It will connect people together. We hear so much about uh, interoperability as being interoperability of assets. But what you just described is like interoperability of like gameplay loops or interoperability. It's in a new way that I haven't quite heard before. Yeah, it's like uh, the people in this game put up a pass for the people in other games. In other games, they either they finish or they fail a pass will have positive, positive or negative or negative effect into the toy people in other games as well. So there are a lot of games could connecting to each other. In game design, we call it uh, a symmetrical uh, game, uh, game design. So it means that it's, uh, uh, it's, different, uh, it's different in both sides. So one side play a game and the other side want to play another game. It's were actually uh, the concept that uh, Dick uh, was talking about were actually used in game before. If you play Mass Effect 3, uh, the mission that you play, this was a uh, part of the uh, 
a part of the story mode. So the story mode, there's a world that's going on in that uh, galaxy and uh, how like the status of the, uh, the world will directly affect the story. So if, you, if a lot of people play in the multiplayer mode and win, then the story mode will lean toward that, uh, like, that uh, you are the, the winning side and uh, the vice versa. So Mass Effect 3 already uh, did something similar to that. But we are talking about something that are much larger than that. Uh, very, very cool. Um, guys, I'd love to open it up if there's any questions from the audience. Maybe we'll take a couple seconds here. Hey, what's up, guys? Uh, my name is Pam, and I'm a content creator for YGG. I am a homeland player as well and a land owner as well. Uh, currently, our earnings from land is primarily through staking, and it's a good amount, but obviously that's not going to be the sustainable way to go towards the future. How are the earnings going to shift in land and land gameplay? Are we going to have to play it? Are we going to have to grind it out? Is there going to be leaderboard earnings? Like, what's the, what's the ultimate plan for earnings? I really don't know if I can answer this question, but uh, I can tell you that uh, the leaderboard format is not going to be the, uh, stable in land. We are, it's going to be, uh, no, it's going to, no, we are going to change it into an event base. Normally, on, uh, when uh, there's no event come, uh, going on, uh, we, you can still play land and uh, earning uh, like normal. So it's, it's going to be an ongoing game, not a game based on a season. It's a great question though, Spam. Guys, I think we have time for one more if there's any other questions in the audience. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, Dirk uh, and Julie. Uh, I have one question so regarding the game design. What is the big, biggest challenge when you design a Web3 game comparing with like Web2? One of the biggest challenges when we make a Web3 game is the perception of uh, the player. So when people think about on a Web3 game, only they think about it tokenomic. And uh, it's kind of like making the, uh, like a lot of audience uh, really look at it in a really bad way because a lot, a lot of games use it as a scamming method for, uh, to uh, make money fast. So that is uh, the perception that we have to work when we like when I say that I'm making blockchain game, I'm in uh, danger of being attacked by someone. <laughs> so blockchain is a technology and tokenomics is definitely a big part of it. Like it's not all that blockchain is. Uh, just like the internet, there's a lot of uh, possibility that you can uh, do. And uh, so right now we are taking baby step, like we base uh, everything on uh, what we know about game, like traditional game and we design it based on that, and then we start to insert a uh, blockchain element into the game. Once the foundation is like solid and uh, really strong, then we uh, will start inserting more Web3 uh, element into the game, and then take the traditional element out of the game, so that they can stand on their own by the time. And that's why uh, I say that this is gonna take a long time, like 10 or five, uh, five or 10 years, until we uh, realize that uh, what is uh, like the true Web3 game is gonna be. Uh, if there's no other questions, guys, I think we'll go ahead and, and call it at this. Um, we do have a couple of gifts for our speakers on stage. Lovey, if you could bring those out. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We are going to begin panel number three, or discussion number three, which is all about funding for indie game developers in Vietnam. So if you are a startup, indie game developer, maybe you're doing it solo, or maybe you have a team, this one's going to be incredibly valuable for you because building a game is not easy, and sometimes having a little help uh, can make all the difference. So today we're going to have a special panel here. Uh, we have Wee Han, who is a venture partner at GGB Capital. Why don't you say hello? Next up we have Bin, who is the general partner at Ascend Vietnam Ventures. Let's give him a round of applause, everyone. And finally, we have Hawkins, who is the Director of Growth and Operations at BNG Corporation. All right, so obviously we have an all-star panel that's gonna give you a deep insight into the VC world, funding, and everything you need to know about uh, funding your game. So you guys ready to get started, yeah? So to start things off, you know, a lot of people here are indie game developers and they're looking to maybe get funding for their project. So for you guys who are professional investors and you see startups and teams all the time, you know, like right now for you, like what are, what are some interesting things that you guys are looking to invest in? Like some trends or, you know, what is it like? Is it gaming? Is it blockchain? Like what are you guys looking at right now? I guess I've been volunteered. I mean, there's a tremendous amount of excitement on, on our end. Uh, so a little bit of caveat, we don't invest in game 
content. We don't invest in media. I mean, there's a lot of great investors out there, investors like Play Ventures out of Singapore that do focus on game studio investment. We invest in game infrastructure, you know, uh, companies like uh, Axie Infinity and Sky Mavis. But for us, you know, this time where, number one, there's a, there's a big VC reset, but more excitingly, um, AI. You know, for me, every day that I, that I see this, these inventions that happen, I almost want to, you know, stop, put down my, my phone and my, my computer and scream to the world, like, oh my God, I, this is incredible. I've never seen this before. This is impossible five months ago. And, and then this is happening on a daily basis. But for me, you know, I, I do focus on software rather than content. That said, I think a lot of the basics are the same. You know, it really starts with a team and a vision. I agree, Ben. Just two words, AI. Right. It's, uh, look, I, I know it's, uh, everyone you know, talks about it to death almost, but uh, I, in my day job, right, I actually do a lot of work with AI, you know, we, we build tools on top of, of different models, right? And so, you know, the, the, uh, you know, I have a project going on right now where you know, people are no longer even involved in the, the editing, the writing, it's just all automatic, right? So that, and that's just like, as Ben said, just the last few months, right, it's doable. And you know, I'll, I'll be a little bit contradictory here, at least uh, I feel like a dinosaur a little bit in this Web3 environment because we're very... I'm the oldest person in the room. Yeah, yeah I know. But I got that. But, <laughs> but I, I still feel a little bit uh, of a dinosaur, um, you know, with uh, our Web2 focus. Um, you know, we're a very traditional publisher. So content for us is still king. We have gone out pretty aggressively at looking at how to switch from being a traditional publisher into a developer. And we have made several investments. We made about half a dozen investments over the past two years. I took a tour of Axie Homeland for the first time earlier, and I see dynamics there that are really traditional with great gameplay. And so it's good to see that Web3 is still built on the emphasis of great gameplay that we've experienced in Web2. All right, I want to do. I want to add on that because I can't contain my excitement. Because as an ex builder, this period of time is really exciting for several different reasons. That there's paradigm shifts that happen in gaming. Like the first one was probably the internet, followed by mobile, and you know I think social was the next one when it came to. You remember the Facebook games? I had a friend who uh, started Car Town, zero customer acquisition costs, and he had this incredible number, sold his company, raised like four million bucks, sold his company for a hundred million dollars. That ended. Now there's a cataclysmic shift in that world. You know, the monetization with IDFA, ID is, uh, IDFA is the ID for advertisers, and Google's getting rid of cookies at, at the end of this year. And that has shifted that entire business model. It's, it's wrecking it. So a lot of these folks now are going to try to figure out, how do I monetize? What is the next business model? And for the longest time, you know, ownership of assets, being able to have reputation in games, this Web3 allows all of this, right? So this time to build where the ro railroads, the um, highways, the infrastructure like Ronin is now built. And so you're gonna see, even down during this downturn, now the believers start coming back for content. Not to earn crypto, not, not play to earn, but play and earn, and really get a much more sustainable, keep the fun on top, the side benefits of engagement and ownership and everything else um, secondary. And then move to a world where you are more and more living this Web3 ethos where things just can be composed on top of each other. An Axie character here can go into another world. Game can be just cross-pollinated where there's no you know, big king that controls everything, right? There's always been this natural distrust between game developers and, and players. And with Web3, that goes away. So I'm, I'm super pumped up about you guys, anyone who's building right now, because you know, you're gonna look back in five, 10 years and say, what a great time. All right, that makes sense, and I appreciate you guys sharing that. Now, uh, a question I actually had um, as Hawkins was talking is, uh, you know, you, right now you're kind of looking at Vietnam as a, a market to find founders that you want to invest in, but 
it seems like you're saying that it's challenging to find the right teams you're looking for. So, you know, there's a lot of people here who are building games or maybe infrastructure as well. So it's like, what do you need to see in order for them to stand out from the rest of the crowd? Well, we were looking about a year or two ago and, and Web3 basically crushed it because everybody basically put crypto or some sort of token on their valuation and valuations just went crazy. Um, and, and we really started to narrow in what we're looking for in terms of the developer and the content. It's more of the mindset of like Hollywood movie producing and we know what, who, what attracts people to our theaters and less exploratory. So I think what's changing in terms of being able to target people mobily, et cetera, there's two groups that are going to win. I think one is Web3 players because they're inventing new infrastructure and new abilities to target and segment. And you can see that from some of the excitement from um, you know, Quinn's talk in the monetization panel. But the other group is the big players, the guys that already have first party data, that already have large ecosystems. It's just going to entrench them and get them bigger and bigger and bigger. So you know, when we're looking for here, we're, we're pretty open and opportunistic, per se. And so my, my thesis for us to build an awesome game ecosystem in Vietnam is to work together. Gotcha. And do you guys have any uh, thoughts or opinions on like what you guys look for in teams and founders? Um, I, I think, you know, the, the, what would help is to have really strong, you know, product management uh, uh, capabilities right, added on to the, to the local teams here. At the end of the day, like a lot of the product that we build, especially in the SaaS space, the Web3 space, is truly global, right? So to be able to find a team that can operate on that level, on a global level, I think that's something that, that uh, would stand out. I mean, I guess it really depends. It changes depending on what I'm investing in, you know? So for me, if I'm looking at a Web3 gaming company, it depends if they're building that infrastructure, they're building something around new possibilities, then I'm looking for someone who's a crypto native, someone who maybe has been um, cutting their teeth around the, the, the concepts of decentralization, of, of being able to uh, really bring the power out to the community and unlock new ways to do gaming on the blockchain. Now, if I'm, I'm, built, I'm looking at a Web3 company that's focused a little bit more around the content, I'd rather have someone who has gaming experience. You know, it's much easier to take someone who has gaming experience, teach them how to do crypto, than vice versa. You know, you need to have grit and determination. And in order to have grit and determination, that needs to come from that, those individuals who have true vision, true passion around changing the world a certain way. You know, like the Axie Infinity team, you know, for them, really bringing asset ownership was the North Star. And you saw that back in 2018. You saw how mission-driven they were, and they weren't going to stop at anything to, to make this a reality. It didn't matter about the crypto pricing. It didn't matter if it went up or down. They're going to continue to build. I've been in Vietnam for 15 years. I'm celebrating my 15 years this week. And I, I've been mostly in traditional finance, real estate, consumer businesses. And when I started uh, building the investment team at VNG, I had a real big inferiority complex because I knew nothing about gaming. And as I got into it, I realized that it's basically the same thing when it comes to team, that it's really all about team. And there's a certain view that I've developed over time where I get a little bit afraid of single founder businesses. It's so much harder to raise money as a single founder. And the reason why is because we as investors know, go into a dark place in, as an entrepreneur sometimes. It's not easy. It is not tough. You're going from zero to one, and it's so much easier if you have a co-founder, somebody else alongside of you that can carry a bit of the weight um, and, and will challenge you and will make your ideas better. Got you. Do you guys have thoughts on that? Because like, you guys are doing more like the Web3 side infrastructure, which anybody can use, right? Yes. So we, we look at scale. And so for us, yes, scale is absolutely required. We are looking for teams that are either targeting these categories that are global in nature, either targeting Southeast Asia, starting with Vietnam, maybe using Vietnam as a launch pad or test bed before they enter the Philippines and Indonesia, or they're going right off the bat, let's go to the US, right? We're gonna build our, our product out here, but our first customers, how we market, 
and how we're gonna get a revenue is the US. And so for us, we've always had this mindset, hey, let's bring Vietnam to the rest of the world. You start seeing that with TikTok, you start seeing that PUBG out of South Korea, you saw that Fresh Works out of, out of India, and now Sky Mavis out of Vietnam. We're gonna see more and more of that over the next five, 10 years. And you know, I'm very confident that Vietnam will also get to that stage at some point in time, right? Even just games alone, let's just, you just take something like, like AOV, right? Which is very popular in Vietnam and I think to some extent Thailand as well, right? Totally doesn't work in Indonesia and Malaysia, right? What's big there is like MLBB, right? It's big in Indonesia, Malaysia, Philippines, Myanmar and so on, right? Even something as simple as a game that's as similar as that, right? I think Grab is doing it because they can't do other countries, right? Because they have some contract with Uber or whatever, Didi, right? So like if your product's any good, then take it global, take it to a few countries, few regions. Why, why, why be in this region? It, get, it depends on the scale. So I do think that there's, you know, a lot of people talk about, hey, it's cloning. You're taking this idea from a more developed country and you're, you're not being innovative or whatever. Actually, it's just a natural evolution of ecosystems and needs, right? If you think about what does a consumer need when they get on, get on mobile, they have a smartphone or internet for the first time. They need to eat. They need to go places, they need to, like, it's just the same stuff, right? The same thing with the business. They need to understand their customers, they need to reduce their, their costs, they need to be able to remarket to them, they need to understand their finances. And so these needs are very natural. Um, they're not a invention of the West. And so it's really smart to be able to understand these natural needs of both consumers and businesses and develop them in a way that is unique to the customers here. So the challenge for the region though, again, being diverse, is being able to take that core innovation, take that to the Philippines, high, or, or the Indonesia, hire a, a local team, build a product around that core innovation, and make it Filipino, make it Indonesian, and love and respect that customer as if you love and respect Vietnam. And that's how you get that scale and start serving these customers natively. Okay, I gotcha, that, that makes sense. And um, for the people out here who are, let's say, indie game developers, and they are trying to attract the attention of VCs like yourself, like how do they go about that? Is it that they just send you a cold email? Do they need a referral? Like what's the, what's the deal? Cold email works. I mean, um, <laughs> I think it's really about how authentic you are, how passionate you are in terms of like, getting that message across. You do want to be ruthless when it comes to qualification. You know, I do think that there's a um, group of investors out there. If you're creating content, your, your studio, there are funds specifically looking at game studios and, and, and content. If you think about the different types of investors out there, there's angel investors, there's strategic investors. So you're looking at like a VNG, right? They're not looking exactly just to make a ton of money off of you. They're, they're, they want to invest in you because it's strategic to their initiatives. And then you have institutional investors. Their number one goal is that, hey, they're, sell, they're selling their LPs a product. We know how to choose game studios and we're going to be able to make a massive return for you. So that's what we're going to do. So they promise that they're only going to invest in game studios. And so these type of, these type of funds like Play Ventures are, are very, very suitable for game studio investments. That, that's what they do all day. It's not just tweaking a feature, a game mechanic here or there. It's about this vision you might have, something that is very, very sustainable to be able to go and generate these type of revenues that they're looking for. So, so Ben, as a fund manager, gets paid to invest money. I, as a corporate guy, get paid not to lose it. So, you know, he, he's going to answer your inbound email. He's going to come knocking at your door, et cetera, et cetera. If you're knocking on our door, it's probably the wrong door to knock on. If we have a mandate, like we're very strategic, we know what we're looking for, we'll come and find you, we'll knock on your door. The question is, is how to, how to get yourself known and, and, and exist. And I think it goes the same way as how you would market a game. And you know, if you're getting traction and you know building games and have a track record, you're going to be on our radar. We're going to know you. We're gonna, it's a, certainly a small market, so I think it's more of a we're an outbound type of investor rather than like an inbound investor. But I agree with Ben that you know rather than asking for an investment, knock on our door, ask for advice, figure out how to network, build community.
um, is probably the right way to go. The, um, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm right, right in between, right? So in this early stage, Hawkins is, uh, is corporate uh, investment, right? So for, for growth stage, actually, right, um, the business is actually fairly clear cut, right? So like for us, we, we look at companies, we only look at companies that are ready to scale, essentially, right? So if you are before that, then it's probably too early. But for me, my threshold is that at the very, very least, demonstrate good product market fit of some size, right? But at the end of the day, you know, the, the VC business is still a very people business, actually, right? So what do I mean by that is, for, for example, let's, say, let's just say there's a really hot company, right? Really a sexy company. The founder will take the VC money, will take money from the VC that he or she likes the best, right? For whatever reason, because money is money. So, so, so there's that element, but it's also true on the reverse side as well, right? So when a VC, say, you know, in a given industry uh, has some few choices to choose from, Usually, you know, it's the person that has built the best relationship with the, with the investor, right? That would make a that that marginal difference, right? Um, so yeah, I mean, it's um, you know, I know the, the 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 venture business has grown a lot in the last ten years, but still, you know, people say it's the last cottage industry in finance, and there's some truth to that actually. All right, makes sense. So now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up to our audience for questions. So if you had any questions for our audience over here, feel free to raise your hand, and we'll give you a mic. We got a question over here. On the left side. First of all, thank you so much for your panel. My question for you guys is that you know uh, previously, uh, some of the, the um, you know the more important things about a startup that investor look at is you know um, product market fit and, and traction and things like that. And then you know currently with uh, this downturn, investor would have to look at you know um, other aspects. And, and 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 one of the, the new aspects that I've been you know seeing a lot from these investors uh, in, in what they look for is team market fit. Is that you know. Is this team the perfect team to work on this product? Now, I would love to hear more about you guys, like your thought on that, and and, and how important it is for a market like Vietnam. And your founder market fit is really important. I mean, you want to be able to build something because you care about it, right? If you live through something and you want to fix it, you want to change the world around you because you're fixing your own problem, that's great product market fit. I, I take a slightly different mindset to this, which is to say that like people can grow into the role, right? So, uh, if you are at the right place, at the right time, like you know, if and if you're a good founder, right? I think the odds are you can step up, you will learn, and you will grow, right? So, I see the the, the founder and team market fit thing probably comes before uh, product market fit, meaning that if you're in an earlier stage, that's probably what people evaluate on, right? But if you really have some, you're building some steam, right, off of your product market fit, there's some real, some real traction, then. I think most people will just jump, jump in it and do their best. Yeah. There are three other factors. So you, if you're going to go out to fundraise, besides identifying that this person uh, invests in the, your type of company, there's three other factors you should uh, remember. Number one, what stage of investor are they? You know, there are investors specifically looking for idea stage or very early before product market fit. And once you've gotten product market fit, you're just too late. You know, oh, yeah, you're too big or you know, whatever. Right, and so that you'll they'll pass on you. So, be ruthless with that um, set stage uh, characteristic. The second one it would be, I'm guessing here, like there might be funds out there that only do uh, Web three, or they only do strategy type of games, or, or or whatnot. And so, being able to get that type of genre or sector focus nailed down is really important. And the third and most important, they have money. <laughs> There's a lot of funds out there that might not have money. They're in between fundraising and they're talking, oh, hey, I'm an investor. And then some of the best questions she asks is like, hey, where are you in your deployment? You know, do you have dry capital, dry powder to deploy? Really normal questions don't, if they're not insulting, they're gonna think you're very, very sophisticated. All right, makes sense. And do we have any other questions? So we have one over here on the left side. Uh, at the beginning of this talk, you guys spoke about AI and how that's exciting to you guys. Now, for us, we use AI as a, an extra team member. It helps us with code. It helps us with conceptualization, artistic direction. I mean, things like MidJourney and ChatGPT are just, they're another part of our team. But what would you say is the most interesting usages of AI that you can share with us? So, I, I agree with you. I think looking at AI as like exoskeleton is the right way to look at it. It's not going to necessarily replace a human body, but it's going to be an exoskeleton to make you stronger. And one of the things that we're doing in terms of game development is looking at how to 
segment different parts of the journey and look at where AI can augment it. So in the early stage, like how do you create better stories? Well, that's more language processing. Or how do you create better characters? Well, that's where stable diffusion and mid journey might come in. Then when you get into the marketing elements, there's different aspects, like things that can help you automate marketing campaigns. So is, is it fair to say that you're just, from that perspective, you're just kind of saying AI speeds up the process. So instead of a human being drawing a hundred trees, you know. It's a cost thing, right? Being able to lower the cost of, uh, of doing things. You still need good quality content. You still need a human to be able to understand what AI's done is brought up the common denominator. And so, you know, if you're a great game artist, you know, being able to experiment and ideate and get to that incredible uh, world, that, that prototype world, is you're gonna be able to do 100 times more um, uh, iterations than, than you could before. Look, look, I agree, right, that all AI will, will do all the magical stuff. But to me, that's like the surface level stuff, right? If you take a, say, like a three, five, even 10 year perspective on this, I, I truly think AI is not really about cost efficiency, it's actually about disruption. Even just think about how you use ChatGPT, right? A lot of the stuff that you rely on, whatever, marketeer, writers, and all that, right, have gone away. And we're just, we're just like three months to this, right? So imagine we're three years into this. So I, I truly think that we have something that's uh, just so disruptive, right? We haven't even seen it yet. All right, hey, if we don't have any questions, then we're all good. So uh, we actually have a gift for our lovely panel over here, if we can get that going. All right, thank you everybody for sharing your insights. Thank you all the panelists and all the guests for coming out to this event. I want to remind you that this event was sponsored by Sky Mavis, IGGB, the Indie Games Group Vietnam, and organized by S-World. So that's it for our Power Tech Talk today, and we will see you at the next one.